Hello everyone and welcome to VIB Systems new webinar, Certificates for Authenticity, Authentication or both. Each month join us for new powerful messages, technical tips and success stories that will leave you inspired and ready to get your protection, licensing and security techniques another step closer to perfection. Our hosts today are Rudiger Kugler, VP Sales and Security Expert at VIB Systems and Wolfgang Völker, Director of Support and Product Management and Vibu Systems. Rudiger first encountered software development in 1988, working in Fortran, C and Assembler as part of his physics degree course. After completing his studies, he worked with Macromedia Director and Delphi in a series of multimedia projects. He was one of the pioneering developers who used Java applets for website banner adverts. Beginning in 1995, he was active as a project leader in multimedia and security projects for banks, online retailers and software developers. Since 2003, Rudiger has been working with Phoebe Systems as a security expert and leader of the professional services team. His core competencies include the protection of software against reverse engineering and the integration of licenses in the internal processes of software vendors. Wolfgang has been working for Vibu Systems since 2002, where he leads both the product management and the support teams. Through his extensive consulting activities, he has acquired a deep knowledge in many programming languages and development environments, such as C, C++, Java and C Sharp. In its role, his main focus is offering an ever-increasing professional and reliable experience with CodeMeter the all-in-one solution for protection, licensing and security needs. Today we are going to talk about fundamentals of certificate-based technology and their relation to software protection, licensing and security, a journey from essential elements to security requirements and applications in order to master certificate usage, implement software authenticity, enforce user authentication, ensure integrity and access right management. This session is being recorded and a link to the replay will be posted directly to you in a couple of days. You are all muted, but you can post your questions in the live chat room. We will answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. And now, let's get started! Hello, my name is Rüdiger Kügler and I'd like to welcome you to our presentation broadcast about certificates. Uh, maybe you have uh, visited our broadcast half a year ago. In this broadcast we uh, talked about uh, cryptography, about asymmetric cryptography and symmetric cryptography. And uh, in this broadcast we also introduced the, the terms private key and public key. This is something that we also will use today. And as a short summary, so in asymmetric cryptography uh, things, um, you have a private key that you have yourself, that you own yourself and you, as the name already tells, uh, you keep this private key private. It's a secret key and the public key can, is, all, is known to, to everybody. And uh, now Wolfgang will explain you how this public and private key stuff can be used to send a signed message. Hello and also a warm welcome from me today. My name is Wolfgang and at first we will have a look about sending a signed message. So I'm the sender and I want to send a message. So the message um, is some data and from this data we calculate a hash first. A hash is a cryptographic one-way function that uh, has as a result a short uh, byte sequence, most times 32 bytes not depending on the number of bytes that you have as data. And one of the properties of a hash function is that if the data changes also at one bit, then the hash is completely different. So hash functions are uh, very good for checking if you have any change in a message if you have any manipulation or transmission error or whatever. And so we calculate this hash 
first and then we sign this hash. Instead of signing the complete data, we just sign the hash. For uh, signing, we need our private key, our secret key, and then we get the signature. So as a result, we have our message as data and the signature. The data itself is uh, not necessarily um, encrypted. This is just plain data. And so every can, everyone can read it, but we want to check on the other side, on the recipient side now, that this data has not been changed. So we send over our message together with the signature to the recipient. And on, on this side, um, the ca hash is calculated a second time and should be, of course, the same if there was no transmission error or manipulation uh, at the data. Then we use the public key to verify the signature that we got. And as a result, you get an OK or you get an not OK. And depending on this, you can decide how to continue. If everything is fine, it returns to green state and you can trust that the data is really sent by this sender. Okay, so let's assume that I'm the recipient and uh, that Wolfgang is the, the sender of this message. And uh, so let's also estimate we have never seen and, uh, uh, each other, so we have no, no contact. Okay, today we're sitting together, but let's, uh, let's uh, just estimate we would never be here together. And um, so, so the question is, if I have this uh, public key of, of Wolfgang, how do I know that this is real, his, his public key, and it's not a fake public key of, of uh, somebody else, Wolfgang? How, how do I know that your public key is really your public key? Well, I send you uh, a certificate with my public key and all uh, the information that we have in the certificate, so you can be sure that this public key um, is from me. This public key certificate is um, transferred and stored in X509 format. And um, for example, let's have a look how it looks like. Um, on the right side you see we have some common name. There are some fields that are um, necessary and there are a lot of optional fields and attributes that you can set. And you see this is uh, my certificate and um, my company name and my business unit is written there and there's also my public key inside. And this certificate is issued um, by, uh, in this case, Webo Systems. So Webo Systems itself has signed this certificate and um, assures that um, this public key belongs to its member, its staff member, uh, Wolfgang Völker. In general, the identity of a certificate um, can be a person, so as we see it here, or it can also be a company or a group, um, or also um, a use case that we have very often, it can be a server system, an IT system. So as you can see here, you have a certificate which shows you this is my public key and you should trust this. Yeah, but um, how do I know that this certificate is uh, genuine? Uh, or maybe you also sent me, or the, the other person who says I'm Wolfgang Völker sent me just a fake certificate. So how can I check that this certificate is not uh, changed and is, 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 is really a, a valid certificate? Well, the certificate itself is signed by the issuer. So in this case by Webu Systems. And so um, you can validate this certificate by the public key um, of the issuer. Okay, uh, this sounds interesting, but uh, for me the next challenge is coming up, uh, which is um, how do I know that the public key of uh, the issuer is really the public key of the issuer, not the public key of a fake issuer? Well, also the issuer has a certificate, and uh, this certificate might be issued directly by a certificate authority that you already trust. 
So you have normally uh, within your operating system, within your um, browsers, uh, some root certificates from a certification authority like VeriSign or someone else, and you trust them. You have this, they are uh, known certificates and all of the internet world trusts the certificates and we are sure that they only will issue certificates on the next level for people they have or people of com or companies they have checked so if you look at the um, in your browser for example um, uh, here in the internet explorer you see um, the trusted rule certification authorities there's a list of uh, several ones and you get um, yeah you get these together with your operating system or with your browser and uh, as you see here on uh, my screenshot there are a lot of already trusted root certificates on, on your machine and uh, next time when you get a Windows update and you see there's a package uh, which is called uh, new certificate package or new root certificate package then you know what it's for. It is an update which uh, issues or delivers new root certificates to your to your computer. And of course this is not only included in Windows, it's also in, uh, included in the Macintosh operating system and included in uh, Linux and so on and so this uh, root certificates are already included in nearly every operating system. As we can see here, there is a certificate hierarchy. So um, we have now here three levels, but this can be more. Um, so you have a root certificate, which issues some certificates for some intermediate certificates that are used for issuing other um, certificates. And so you have this hierarchy and you can check this chain up if you, for example, start with Stefan um, at the bottom, uh, at the left bottom, um, then you can see that this certificate has been issued by uh, Inter1 and this one has been issued by root and so you can check one certificate after the other until you get back to the root certificate um, that you can trust. And so this means I only need to trust the root certificate. So if I have this in my trust in my list of trusted certificates, then I can use this to check all the other certificates which are derived from this uh, root certificate. So it's a quite easy and, and simple thing. If you are a software developer and you want to develop uh, solutions using such certificates, then uh, of course it's a um, uh, is an, an effort to uh, create such a certificate and let it sign by a root authority and, and so on. And uh, therefore there are the so-called self-signed certificates and this is a certificate that you uh, generate your own. So you take your private key to uh, sign this certificate for your own. So it's uh, signed with the same key which is included in the, in the, in the certificate and uh, typically this can be used for test purposes. So if you have a web server that you set up only for your own or for an internal usage then you can create such a self-signed certificate, you can apply it to your web server and then when you go to this web server you first get a message, oh this is a self-signed certificate and this is not trusted by a root authority, do you like to trust it now? And then you can say yes and uh, from this point on everything works fine and then you can use it as a standard normal certificate. So this is a good way for testing and developing software using certificates is a good way to use such a self-signed certificate for your first initial tests. There may also be the necessity uh, to revoke some time certificates. For example, your private key has been stolen. In such cases um, uh, the certificate cannot uh, can no longer be trusted and so it needs to, needs to be revoked. Uh, for this there have been established certificate revocation lists. They include uh, the serials of invalid certificates and uh, if you get an update for your 
browser um, they deliver together with this also the certificate revocation list. So up from the moment where you get this list you will no longer trust some uh, special certificate if you uh, serve to a uh, page that is using this certificate. Of course there's also a protocol to do an online uh, check uh, for this and uh, well it depends of course if this is really used and if your revocation lists are also up to date. So, so in the case of um, uh, your private key has been stolen or it was be compromised by um, trust the hack or, so, or something else then a certificate revocation list make sure that uh, it cannot be used by uh, somebody else. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Wolfgang, uh, I think there are a lot of use cases. Um, can you tell me about uh, use cases? In which use cases were such certificates used? Well, the first use case I see is uh, the server certificate. So that's what uh, we are doing every day. We are surfing in the internet and um, then we go to pages uh, that we uh, should trust. For example, if you are doing some uh, home banking using your browser, then you need uh, to check um, that you are really connected to the bank you want to be connected to and not to a, a page that is has been placed somewhere in the Internet. And for this, uh, we have the server certificate. So you as a client, as a user, can check the um, identity of the server so everything um, is okay if you get an established uh, secure connection. The second use case are the client certificates. With the client certificates the client can uh, authenticate against the server. So if the server wants to be sure that he gives access to some pages, for example, only to special clients, then the clients can use client certificates and having this, they can show the server who they are and then they get through and get um, their contents. We are doing this in our hosting center here in Germany, the we were operating services where we are working, for example, with uh, such client certificates to allow uh, the owners of the hosted license central to do the configuration in the web front end. Another uh, use case are the email certificates or VPN certificates, so a personal certificate which you have and where you can, for example, sign your emails so everyone else in the world can check if you if he gets an email from you that it's really um, from you. And very important uh, thing is the communication between individuals and machines or between machines and machines. And uh, therefore there's a standardized uh, protocol which is called OPC and there's a new version which is called uh, OPC uh, UA, UA for Unified Architecture. And uh, but what, what does this mean? So this means that uh, every uh, PLC or every embedded device, every machine has its own small server and uh, everybody can connect to this machine and say, oh, I want to uh, get some data and some, uh, 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 do some measurements on, on, this, on this device or I can change some data and say, okay, uh, you should uh, increase speed or decrease speed of, of something. And uh, if you think of a standardized uh, protocol that you can use to speak with a machine, speak with a machine and say, "Oh, uh, turn faster or, or or turn slower," in this case, of course, you need a lot of security, and that's why in the specification of this uh, unified architecture standard, uh, the definition 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 says uh, you should use certificates for the um, uh, check of both sides that uh, the right person or the or the right machine is talking with the with the right machine. And this is one more use case where you find certificates uh, today and I think uh, here much more in the future. Another sample is Authenticode. 
authentic code is a way to sign your software and uh, with this authentic code you can make sure that your software is not changed from the way from you to, to your customer. And so the customer can check, oh yes, the software was really developed by you, you as a software developer, and uh, the software was not changed, modified, and so there is no virus in the, in the software. And uh, so the software is signed and they just can check the signature. We will dive a little bit more deeper in this authentic code, what it can do and uh, of course also what it cannot do for you. And um, the thing that authentic code cannot do for you is to check your software in terms of uh, software piracy and in terms of licensing. So if you say, ah, I implement some licensing API and check if a license is there, then do this or otherwise bring an error message. And you say, oh, I'm using authentic code to just check if the software is not modified. This is uh, uh, really a, a, a false friend because uh, you think it's good, but uh, you will see it is not good. And therefore, you need other tools to assure this uh, software, this code integrity of software. And we will show how to do this with uh, our tool AX Protector and how this, this works. Okay, maybe Wolfgang can tell us more about the server certificates. Yes, let's uh, have a look to server certificates. Um, on the right side, on the server side, we have the certificate of the server together with the private key for this um, certificate. So the server has everything that he needs to answer a signing request from the client that is done during the establishing uh, of the HTTPS connection. So such a server certificate, if we are in the um, browser world, um, we need always an HTTPS connection, so secure socket layer uh, to do this. The client can verify by this the identity of the server and this is automatically done during setting up um, the connection and the client can check with uh, one of the root certificates he has uh, stored uh, that this certificate on the right side is a valid one and there's everything okay. So that is what the server certificate does and you can see this if you, for example, look on this uh, screen of the browser Then you have just a lock um, in the, um, at the top to see that this is an encrypted and secure encrypted um, connection. Looks a little bit different in different browsers but it's always um, the same. Well, on the configuration side of the server, um, you need to switch on the secure socket layer, of course, and then you need your private key somewhere and you need the certificate that you got from a certification authority. These are the three things that you need, so um, establishing a server with a certificate um, is not much work. You need, of course, to get a certificate especially for this server and um, then you can switch this on and can offer HTTPS trusted connections. An enhancement of this is the, are the client certificates if you need this. For example, in our hosting area we are doing this as I told you before. So what we have in general is uh, the HTTPS, the secure socket layer on the top having the server certificate on the right side and this is done um, of course all the time. Then as an addition we have the possibility that the server can check the identity of the client. For this the client has its own certificate and a client private key. This one um, is um, used to sign a request that is coming within the protocol from the server during establishing um, the connection and um, the certificate of the user, of the client, here has been issued by the authority that also issued the root certificate on the right side. So this is, for example, the um, in the context of 
the company uh, that you are uh, currently working on. There might be a root certificate and there might be one intermediate certificate which then was used to issue the certificate um, for the user. Technically, on the server configuration here, as an example in the Apache, um, you have additionally to the first three lines that we know already, your own root certificate that you need on the server side. Then you define that you want to check the identity of the clients. And then you add some rules. Here, for example, that we want to check if um, the common name of the client certificate equals um, some special email address. So you can have different rules, for example, for different directories, for different parts of your uh, web server, and so you can set up um, yeah, several rules for different customers, for example. Okay, so when we issue such a client certificate, there are two different ways. Uh, one is the recommended way, the standard way, and the other way is the easy way. And uh, let's uh, start uh, with uh, uh, how this uh, recommended way works. And uh, let's assume I'm the client and uh, Wolfgang is the server or the uh, uh, root uh, uh, authority, and uh, how does it work? So in the first step, I, as the client, I generate a key pair. I can uh, use SSL and say, okay, please generate key pair on command line, uh, quite easy, and uh, typing in this, this. And uh, in the second step, I generate a certificate signing request. And this includes, of course, my public key. So I am sending this public key to the uh, certificate authority. And uh, it includes also my name, who I am, uh, what do I want to have, and so such a uh, certificate uh, or certificate signing request is very similar to a self-signed certificate. It's not completely the same, but it's similar to a self-signed certificate. And after creating this uh, request, I send this request to the CA, in this uh, case to, to Wolfgang. So I'm the CA. I now check at first the certificate signing request. Is this valid? For example, I may uh, take the phone and call Rüdiger if he really has sent this with serial number 12345, this uh, request to me, and so I know, yes, uh, it is the correct signing request. Then I generate the certificate and send this back to Rüdiger, and so my work is finished. So now I import a certificate on my system, and now I can use it in my browser to uh, authenticate against uh, License Central. I can use this, of course, in Firefox. I can use this in uh, Internet Explorer or Google Chrome or in any other browser. Uh, by the way, from the uh, from the things in the field, um, if you want to use it in Firefox and in EA, Internet Explorer, then uh, you need to imp import a certificate twice because they both have their own uh, store where they store the, the certificate. But uh, as I told you, this is the recommended way because in this case, uh, I'm the client, I know my private key, I know my public key, and uh, the root uh, authority only knows my public key. So this is from the cryptographic baseline, everything fine, everything okay. Uh, but as I told you, this is also a very complex thing because I need to create this key pair, I need to understand what is a key pair, and so on. And that's why in, in real life we find very often a very easy way to do this, which is not completely uh, good from the cryptographic uh, standpoint, but which is uh, okay from a, from a more practical uh, point. In this case, I, the certification authority, generate the key pair on my own. Then I generate the certificate to state the public key as valid and as a good one. And then I send the certificate together with the private key to the client. Of course, I should uh, do some things um, to make it more complicated to get both the certificate and the private key to anyone that does not uh, is not allowed to get it. So, for example, you may want to use a two way, uh, two different ways to send certificate and private key to the client. 
For example, you may encrypt the private key in a zip file and uh, tell the client the password for the zip file uh, via phone or uh, with an SMS or whatever. So, and then uh, I send this over and this reaches the client. So, and as the client, I just double click on this file and uh, the certificate and the private key is automatically imported in my system, my, my browser, and uh, then I can use it. And so, uh, this version uh, of this uh, creation of a client certificate is more easier because as a client, I just get a file and I get this password maybe via phone or in a separate email. And then I uh, just enter this password when I extract the zip file and then just double click on the on the file and and that's it so it's uh, it's quite easy um, from the security point of view the disadvantage is that now Wolfgang also knows my private key and so the root authority knows already my private key but in most of the typical use cases the these certificates are used for the um, login to one dedicated system and so, if it, I use this certificate only for log into one dedicated system, the system of this vendor, so which is which are operated by by Wolfgang in our Vivo operating services, then okay, uh, why should Wolfgang not know my my private key? So if I'm using this certificate only to this system, then I think this is okay. If I'm using the same certificate also to other third-party systems, then I would say no, please don't use this easy way. Uh, so in the most use cases you can also use this 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 very easy way as i told you the certificates are are stored on on the local computer and the question is uh, where are the uh, private keys and the certificates stored and on on one hand you can store them easily on a file or in a file on the, on the file system the file extension is called uh, pm and um, you can have this pm file with a key or without a key in uh, this case where you have the, the private key, then of course you have an, a file which includes a certificate and your, your private key and you can store it on, on your machine. This is often used on server machines. So if you have a server machine which uh, uses this in the configuration, then you just store the uh, private key in the spam file and the, and the certificate maybe in the same file or in a different certificate file, you can use one or two files. And we have seen this already in the configuration Wolfgang has shown you for the Apache, this uh, PEM file and this uh, CRT, this separate CRT file. And so this is one option. Another option is to use this PEM file with a password. And so that you need to enter a password or that you need to add this password to a configuration or to a script to make sure if someone is able to copy this file with the private key, he cannot use it because it's protected with a password. But a more secure way would be to use a certificate storage uh, and there are two available interfaces for this certificate storage. And one interface is called PKCS11 uh, and the other one is a Microsoft own protocol, a Microsoft Crypto Service Provider. And so you can use this interface to store it on a local uh, uh, certificate storage which means also and file on your operating system but an encrypted and secured file with uh, only limited rights so that uh, a typical user cannot access and, and, uh, and, 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 and copy it. And there are two options. One option is you can just store it on your hard drive in this secure storage or you can uh, store it in a secure token like maybe our, our code meter dongle, our code meter stick, code meter stick, code meter dongle, also available with our code meter cards as SD card, micro SD card, CF card and so on. And all of this uh, code meter devices offer the opportunity to store also um, certificates. Okay, here we uh, see how this would work if we uh, use the dongle for storing the certificates and we offer with the middleware of Charismatics, the so-called CSSI middleware, the possibility to access from both worlds, from PKCS11 and from the Microsoft Crypto Service Provider, the certificate in the dongle. So you have one certificate, one certificate and private key in your dongle and it can be used by both worlds. For example, if you have the Firefox or some open VPN connection, 
they uh, use PKCS 11. If you're using, on the other hand, Outlook or Internet Explorer, they are using the Microsoft Crypto Service Provider. You, of course, may have your own application, and your application, you, you can decide which one to use in case of using the Charismatics middleware um, that you can get from us, then you can uh, choose which is easier for you to implement because everything uh, later on comes to the dog. And this middleware is available for Windows operating systems, of course. Here we have uh, both interfaces and it's available for uh, OS X and available also for Linux operating systems. Of course, here you don't have this Microsoft Crypto Service Provider. Here you have all, only, the, only the standard PKCS11 uh, implementation, which is the standard which is also supported there. And uh, here what we see here is just a sample screenshot from uh, this uh, configurator of the CSSI middleware. CSSI, by the way, stands for Charismatic Smart Security Interface. And here we see I have uh, many certificates. Uh, the one which is marked here is my email certificate. Uh, I think it's a very old one. It was issued by uh, Trust Center. My name is Rudiger Kügler and it was for, issued for Vivo Systems. And uh, with this certificate, I'm allowed to sign and uh, decrypt uh, email messages. And so, uh, as Wolfgang told you already in the beginning, there could be attributes which de define for which purposes I can use such a certificate. And this certificate can be used for signing emails and for decrypting emails. As I already promised you before, uh, I'd like to dive a little bit uh, deeper into, into authentic code. And uh, let's take a look. What does this mean? So I have a, a simple application, just a small demo application. And uh, what we see here is uh, if you right-click on the application, then you get to uh, the properties. And on the properties, you can uh, choose digital signature. And then you find out digital signature information, the digital signature is OK. So it's, it's very fine. And uh, when I start my application, I get uh, just a Hello World application. Everything is, is right. And a simple application relies on authentic code. And uh, I'm bringing one of my favorite uh, quotations. Boy, do I hate being right all the time. OK. And now um, let's assume I'm the evil guy. And uh, when I'm the evil guy, I want to patch this application. And uh, so I found out uh, where is the string right in the software. And I overwrote this with wrong. And so now the sentence is, boy, do I hate to be wrong all the time, which is not true, by the way, uh, but uh, OK. And um, so uh, now if I right click on the application again after changing the application, of course, we see the digital signature is no longer valid because I changed the application. So the sig signature does not belong to the application. And so you see that uh, yeah, the application is, is no longer valid. And the question now is, will this application work? What do we mean, or what do we think? Well, it will not work, of course, because uh, it's not trusted. The digital signature is not valid, so why should it work? Not a good idea to work. OK, then let's take a look. And so I just double-click on the application. And what we see here now, the application starts. OK, uh, it depends a little bit on the settings of the operating system. There are two options. One option is you can have a warning, not an error, just a simple warning. Or you can say, I don't want to be warned, just start the application. And uh, if you take a deeper look, then we see, boy, do I hate being wrong all the time. And so what you see here, my wrong, my patched application starts uh, also if it is uh, signed with, with, with authentic code. And so to rely on authentic code in terms of copy protection, is uh, maybe not a good idea. And so the scary answer is yes, the application is still running also after I, ha I have patched the application. And so as a short summary of uh, this authentic code, if you have a Windows operating system, you can start applications without signature. You can start applications with valid signature. And you can tell the operating system it also should start without any warning uh, applications with an invalid signature. And as I told you before, if I'm the user and I'm controlling my system, I can do everything. And so if I, as a user of the operating system, I want to check, is the application really from the software developer? And uh, is it changed, is it a virus or not? 
then authentic code is very fine. That's why what is is made for, and it's 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 really good for this. But it's not a good idea to use authentic code for copy protection. Well, Rüdiger, I have heard that you may be right with this, but you can check, or I can check within my application, the authentic code signature. Can I? And you think you can check if it is valid, not valid, who has it signed, so is it signed by you, and um, uh, when was it signed by you, so is it the current application, and uh, in case if you think if something is not uh, okay, then you say, oh, I will want to exit my application, maybe you hide a call so that I don't find this uh, check, or you do some wrong calculation, but by the way, I think it's not a good idea because then maybe your user thinks your software is buggy and uh, I'm not sure if you, if you if you want to do this, but uh, this is also something you could do. And uh, okay, so let's take a look. This is my application with uh, an integrate authentic code check, so because I, I thought that you would ask me this question, that's why I also prepared an advanced application which includes this authentic code check and if I click on the do something button then we see authentic code check is okay. Boy, do I hate being right all the time. And now I do the same change on the application and uh, I try to start it and when I start the changed application then I get now the message authentic code check failed. That's I think what you expected. But uh, I would not be Rüdiger if I have not, no idea. And uh, so. Uh, you have your own software and your own software is speaking with the Wintrust DLL. This is the one who is responsible for this authentic code check. And um, so we have a well-known and documented uh, Windows API. And if I want to attack this, I can just uh, patch my Wintrust DLL. But if I want to deliver my patch or my cracked software to my user, my end user, then I could not patch the Wintrust DLL but I can use some hooking functions or, and this is my personal favorite, but only my personal, to override uh, functions during uh, runtime uh, from within this patched application. And therefore, I only need a few lines of code. And uh, I have just uh, three fake uh, bytes, which is just a simple return zero, which means everything is okay. And uh, now I um, go here and uh, I load this uh, Wintrust DLL or if it is already loaded, I'm uh, getting a pointer where it is already loaded. Then I'm finding the entry point of this win verify trust function with get pock address. And then I just override the original functionality with this, yeah, yeah, everything is fine, just say that uh, the uh, signature is fine. And um, I also sometimes I hear, oh, you could not override code uh, in the memory which is executable. Um, this is also not quite accurate. So if you know how to do this, you only need to call the function called virtual protect and with this virtual protect you can remove the write protection from an executable memory, then you can just override with the move command uh, this executable memory and uh, at the end I just reset it, maybe there are some checks in the software which checks if the uh, executable part is uh, read or not, uh, 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 write protected or not. And so I just reset this and uh, then I include only this code into my hacked application. And uh, now, uh, so I just need to inject this code. And uh, now when I start this uh, application, what we see is it still works. And the authentic code checks it now says everything is okay. And uh, as we see here, I see my boy do I hate being wrong all the time. And so, as I told you already, authentic code is very fine to protect the user against viruses, but uh, it's not good to protect you as a software developer against piracy. And uh, I think uh, we have an option uh, how to protect you also against piracy, because I think you're a software developer and you want to be protected and uh, you, your, your software is, 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 is valuable, so you should protect it. And uh, one option for this is use our tool AX Protector. Yes, with the AX Protector, we have the possibility to secure your application. We have this tool, this technique for every kind of application. So if you are uh, creating applications for Windows, if you are creating binaries for Linux, for Mac OS X, if you are 
making .NET assemblies if you are working in with Java. For all of them, we have the AX Protector functionality where we can do uh, protection. Additionally, also for the embedded operating systems, we have um, solutions where we use the CodeMeter embedded driver as a basis and then either the AX Protector that is using this embedded driver or uh, the EX Protector which is doing the checking of the loading um, of the different modules. So we have a lot of, we, we, we cover with AX Protector a lot of different kinds of applications. We also have several kinds of uh, threats that we are fighting against and this here is uh, especially the integrity uh, protection where we are um, talking about so where we detect changes in the memory and we can react. So if someone modifies the application during runtime for example with a hook like Rüdiger did then we can check this and we can react with our um, tool chain and for example we can lock the hardware and so get the license blocked. Of course with AX Protector you have a lot of additional value for the protection of your application so the automatic protection, the IP protection protects you against software piracy, against reverse engineering. We additionally have methods where we detect debuggers um, on several levels and we also can for example lock hardware or give you a hint that there is currently a debugger at work. Another module is the IX protector where we have individual encryption of methods or functions. So functions are encrypted let's say a second time and are only decrypted when they are used. And last but not least, uh, the first topic on the slide here is uh, software authentici authenticity, uh, which is mainly used on embedded target systems. And so if we speak of a of an computer which uh, is owned by your user and you deliver a software running on Windows or uh, running on, on uh, OS, OS 10, then your software downloads the application, he can install also other software programs, applications on his computer and you are just one application, one software uh, of, of many that is running on this computer. In case of an embedded system and you are the manufacturer of this machine or of this embedded system, then uh, you say, oh, on this system, on this machine, only software for me should work and not uh, software that a customer can install, just download from the internet, some additional apps or something like this. So this is a, a thing which should not work on a, on a machine. And so here we have the option to say um, with our EX protector also um, that um, we only allow software to be run or to be executed on this machine which is redesigned by you as a software developer. And so you can say in this case it's my machine and only my software should run and so no malware, no antivirus, no, uh, so no virus software, also no fake no change of the application, no manipulation and so you have a more better option to protect your software against uh, manipulation. Let's take a look how a our AX Protector works. So AX Protector takes the compiled application so you don't need to think about protection during your development of the application. You just compile your application, executable, dynamic link library, shared object, dialib, uh, what, whatever you want and uh, then you automatically encrypt your application and now it becomes a protected application. And AX Protector first encrypts the application using some keys from our copy protection system code meter, keys that you can store in a dongle or that you can store in a license file that you can have on a server in a local network, in a wide area network or in the cloud. So uh, using our standard code meter to protect software against piracy by using this encryption. 
But the major topic of today is uh, this in integrity. And for this we have uh, the, also a private key which is used by AX Protector which is also stored in your master dongle, your firm security box. And with this private key your application, protected application becomes signed. And so there's a signature at the end of the application and of course the fitting public key for the check of this signature is embedded in the AX engine. AX engine is our security uh, mechanism or engine that we automatically add to your encrypted application. So we take your application, encrypt it, add our security engine and then we sign the whole application with your, your private key. And um, this can be used now during runtime to check the integrity of the application. Well, and at first, uh, when the application starts, it loads the AX engine, and from this, we get the hash of the executable. So we calculate with our one way uh, hash function the hash, and then we check the hash with the signature. So the hash and the public key can check then the signature and this should be as have as a result yes it's okay and uh, if it's not okay so if something has been manipulated if something is not okay then you run into an error case and of course you cannot only check your own executable in this case you can also say oh we have an executable and a DLL let's say it is in this picture here and uh, then the executable can um, also take a look in the memory of the dynamic lint library and can read it out and then he reads out the signature and then he used the public key which is stored in the executable to check if the dynamic link library, library is signed and if this dynamic link library is, is valid or if it is modified. And uh, you can also do this uh, from the link library uh, to the link library itself or from the link library back to the executable and so every module can check itself and all the other modules using this uh, signature and using the public key in our AX engine. And uh, there are some very interesting use cases. So for instance if your application consists of an executable and an DLL which is the engine so which includes most of your functionality and then one of the threat scenarios is uh, that somebody else just uses your DLL to create its own application. And uh, you want to avoid that uh, a customer who has purchased your uh, application uh, should not be uh, able to use also a third party application on the same machine which using your already licensed DLL. It should only be run in your executable and not in a foreign executable. And therefore, the DLL can check, oh, is the executable really signed by me? And if it is signed by me, then uh, the software will uh, continue working. And if I find out, oh, this is a wrong executable, it's not signed or not signed by me, or the signature is not valid, then the DLL says, oh, uh, stop, and uh, it says I will not uh, execute, and so I will not, I cannot be used in this, in this environment. And uh, also from the executable to the DLL, so they are very interesting, interesting options that you have with this uh, checking vice versa executable and, and DLL. If, if you have a partner uh, which should use this DLL then it's quite easy. You just make an OEM version of the DLL which checks against the signature of this partner and now the partner can use your DLL instead of you and so it's also easy to have this scenario where you want to allow only one or some partners to use your DLL and then you can also use the same mechanism to uh, allow that your partner, this single partner, can use your libraries and your, your functionalities. And um, uh, if you see, oh, this look has a lot of options and we can do so many things. Uh, the question is, Wolfgang, is this complex to implement in uh, your software? No, of course, it's uh, quite easy. So the self-check of the executable or the self-check of the DLL is just done by uh, one option in the X protector. So the option CAV uh, enables the self-check and um, this, of course, can be done also in the graphical interface so you don't need to go to a command line. Yeah, it's just an option 
in the graphical interface, which is already checked per default. If you want to check other modules, then you need um, to specify them, we, because we need to know which kind of DLLs, which kind of XE you want um, to check, and this has to be defined, can be either done in the VBC file um, as check code integrity DLLs, or also in the graphical interface in a list where you can add the different modules that you want um, to check. As I already told you, uh, for embedded operating systems, uh, AX protector is named EX protector. And uh, so there is a, is a difference between AX and EX. So AX stands for automatic executable, and EX stands for embedded executable. And uh, embedded uh, has, has two meanings there. Uh, first, it is for embedded operating systems. And on the second, the um, a, uh, EX engine now is embedded in the operating system itself. So in case of AX protector, we take an executable and what we get is an executable. In case of this EX embedded executable protector, we take an executable, maybe a downloadable kernel module on uh, VXWorks or maybe a real-time process RTP on VXWorks. We just take this executable, we encrypt it, and what we get is an encrypted, an encrypted file which is not a st st uh, which will not uh, execute standalone and so for this you need this ex engine which is integrated in the operating system and so in modified operating system now checks before it loads its its modules its executables or, or libraries it now can check is this executable signed or not and so on the embedded system we have also the option to say i will only allow that my own software can run on this embedded device and no other software should be work here on, on my own device. And um, it's also possible to integrate this already in the boot uh, mechanism, so in a bootloader, and in this case you can encrypt the whole operating system. So in case of VXWorks, the complete VIP image can be encrypted and you, then you integrate our EX engine. Uh, by the way, uh, this is already available for VXWorks 7 as in, in, a, in a standard package um, as a basic security and an advanced security profile or code miller security profile which uh, comes originally de delivered with, uh, with VXWorks 7. And in this case, um, the operating system is encrypted and the bootloader finds out Oh, is this uh, encrypted? Is it signed? Do I have the license to decrypt it? Is the signature valid? Uh, uh, should I execute operating system? And if it is not valid, it says, oh, sorry, I could not uh, execute because this uh, device, this uh, machine has been manipulated. And there's also one, one more difference between a standard computer and an embedded device. If you're an embedded device manufacturer, we very often see in the field that there's a device manufacturer who builds the device with its firmware, and then there's an application developer who builds the business uh, application on top of this device. This could be a PLC with a PLC runtime and an application which runs on this PLC, or this could be some other high-level programming stuff which is available there. And in this case, uh, the, the use case is that the manufacturer of the device should be able to assign a new firmware, and so that only he is able to change the firmware, but the application developer should be able to uh, change his application. And that's why in this case we don't use simple private key public key cryptography in EX protector, we use certificates and we use a management system so that you can say, oh, uh, this certificate is allowed to change the application level, this certificate is allowed to change on firmware level, and uh, is allowed for an, an device class and so on. And so there's a rights management uh, which answers the question, who can sign which application? Well, after this short trip to the embedded uh, world, we now want to have a look at the usage of the certificates within the code meter world. Um, we have uh, two examples today. The first is uh, the secure firmware update. So for our firmware update, we are working as follows. There is a Webu root certificate, which we have created here. And from this Webu root certificate, we create 
production certificates. In every dongle that we have produced, we, put, we have put the public root key during production. So this is the public root key that can be used to verify everything in the future. So if we now want to do a firmware update to bring you new features to the always already uh, delivered CM dongle, then um, this firmware update is signed with a production certificate. Then you put this firmware to you send this firmware update to the dongle and then the current running firmware, so the old firmware, checks the update so it builds the hash and it checks the signature and the certificate and if everything is okay then it applies the new firmware into its protected memory and after this your firmware is updated. So this is one way where we use certificates. Another one will be um, a little bit of a look in the future. We in the second half of this year we will um, publish CodeMeter 6.0 where we introduce CodeMeter Universal Firm Codes. Such CodeMeter Universal Firm Codes um, can be applied to the CM dongle on one hand or to CM Act licenses on the other hand. So this is working uh, fine for both. And one of the main features of this Universal Firm Code and of the functionality that we introduce then is the license transfer. With this we have the possibility to transfer licenses from one CM container to another without having contact to the software vendor. And to realize to this system we are working with the certificates. So the licenses are signed by the software vendor with a certificate that he already got from uh, Webu Systems. The license itself then consists of a certificate and an encrypted part because we need to ship also some secrets, for example the keys that are used for um, the cryptographic functionality that you need uh, to start your protected application. The license certificate then can also contain an authorization for a license transfer and in this case if there is the authorization for the license transfer, um, then we will send over from one container to another the original certificate and additionally a new certificate that is issued by the sending CM container at this time of the transfer. And these certificates together, these both certificates, show the receiving CM container that he is allowed to store this license and um, to use it later on. Well, with CodeMeter this is done transparently in the background so you don't need to know anything about this. This works um, automatically but this is uh, done using certificates. Now we are at uh, the end of our broadcast session today and we hope uh, you enjoyed the time staying with us and we thank you for your time. You now can, we will now have a look if there are some questions and we will try to answer this. So if you have some additional questions at the moment, just type them into your uh, chat window and we will try to answer them. So let's take a look, are there already questions, Wolfgang? Okay, so I see there, there's one question. Can AX Protector be used together with Authenticode? Uh, yes, yes it can and uh, this is also a very good idea to do this because AX Protector is uh, made to protect you against pirate copies and Authenticode is uh, made to protect the user against viruses and so yes it's a good idea to use both. And uh, the trick is uh, to use AX Protector first. So you need to encrypt your application first with AX Protector and then to sign it additionally once again with, with Authenticode. Uh, this is due to the fact that if you would do the signature with Authenticode first and be encrypted then the signature would become invalid. Uh, 
But if you do it in the other way, AX protector first and then authenticate, then uh, we as uh, our engine, so our AX engine knows which changes were made um, by, uh, by authenticate. And so we can just uh, rewind these changes and check, okay, this is software still valid and so everything everything works fine. So yes, you can use authenticate together with uh, AX protector. And by the way, this is also a good idea. Uh, because um, if you take a look at uh, how does a virus, antivirus program works, uh, an antivirus program uh, checks if a software has a strange behavior. And uh, there are a system of points, and so if this is it doesn't do this, then you get some minus points. If you're doing this, then you get some plus points. At the end, if you reach a certain level, they tell, oh, this could be a virus. And uh, one option is if you have a signed application, signed with, with uh, uh, authentic code, then he thinks, oh, this could be or it should be an application which was made by a software vendor, which we know, which every, everybody trusts the software vendor, and so we get a lot of plus points. And uh, if you have an encrypted application, then this is so strange and oh, oh I don't know. And uh, so you get a lot of minus points with an encrypted application. And so if you use both, then uh, the chance to have a false positive by a virus scanner is, uh, is, is, is nearly zero because uh, you have this many plus points uh, with uh, this authentic code which says, oh, it's coming from a, from a real existing and uh, well-known trusted software developer and then it's okay that it, is, that it is encrypted. And so the usage of authentic code and AX protector together is a good idea to avoid false positives from uh, virus or from, from antivirus programs. So if you have any further questions, feel free to contact uh, us directly or to contact your local sales uh, rep uh, to ask these questions. And uh, if you want to um, uh, test our products, then feel free to order an uh, CodeMeter SDK so that you can uh, check the functionality of, of CodeMeter. And um, yeah, feel, so feel free to ask us. So thank you very much for being our guests for this one hour. Uh, it was uh, was a pleasure, and uh, I like to say bye bye and uh, have a nice day. Also from me, bye bye and have a nice day. Bye.